that okay? Great. Uh, good afternoon. I'd like to thank you for inviting me here to talk about the Newport Medieval Ship. And I'm going to attempt to summarize uh, 16 years of research and discovery in the next uh, half hour or 45 minutes. And I'll try to leave a bit of time at the end for questions. And uh, of course, feel free to ask me questions uh, after the talk. So what I thought I'd do is just briefly talk about the excavation, the discovery of the medieval ship, the excavation, and then the research we did over the uh, intervening years, and then bring you up to speed with where we're at today with the project, and including the conservation and our trial reassembly work, and then talk to you about where the project's headed in the future. Um, was there a uh, pointer? Uh, yeah. And I think it's probably best to give you a bit of background because some of you are probably not familiar with the medieval ship in Newport. Okay. So. Okay, is that, uh, is that better? Stand really close. Okay. So, uh, just the basic facts first. Uh, what you see in this photo were the uh, remains of the medieval ship that was discovered during development work in Newport in South Wales in the United Kingdom in the summer of 2002. It was a complete accidental find. They had not expected to find anything in this area and they put in a sheet pile coffer dam, arguably about twice as large as this room, in one area on this redevelopment site and they put in the sheet pile coffer dam to facilitate excavations. And they started to dig, and seven meters down, they found the intact remains of a medieval, clinker-built medieval ship. So, right, so that was 16 years ago it was discovered. And we know, I'll talk more about the details, especially the general chronology later. But we know that it was built sometime after 1449. And we know that this timber, at least the hull planking for the ship, comes from the upland uh, hinterland of the Basque country. Uh, actually over 100 kilometers inland, and I'll talk more about that later. And, uh, but we also have interesting timbers found in the ship, not part of the original hull, but they look like repairs that date to the late 1460s, and they're decidedly British in origin. And like I said, it's a late medieval uh, merchant ship. We found over 1,000 artifacts inside the vessel, uh, beautifully preserved. I've never seen another shipwreck like this. The archeologists, when they initially discovered, discovered the vessel, were actually walking on the original timbers in their boots back and forth during the excavation process. And this was due to the remarkable preservation of the timbers. Not only was the ship made with uh, almost entirely of oak, the oak was tarred, very heavily tarred, during the use life of the ship. And then it was uh, deposited in this estuary, in this river bank. The preservation conditions, it was cold, it was dark, um, it was wet and there's no oxygen, and it was extremely stable. And so when the ship became buried in the side of the riverbank, uh, the decay, it really didn't decay, and I'll talk more about this. It's waterlogged, but the actual cellular structure of the timber is almost fully intact. And very interestingly, we have these Basque links for the construction of the vessel, but every single thing we find on board that has, that's diagnostic in terms of the ceramics, the coins, the in, uh, plant remains, anything that you can get a very specific location on is Portuguese. And we know that it came into Newport in the late 1460s. And we know this because of tree ring dating both above and below the ship that helped bracket it to a very specific time in, uh, between 1468 and 1469. So in broad terms, we have a very rough estimate of the, the existence of the vessel sometime after 1449, probably very soon after that was its construction, and then it came into Newport late 1468 or early 1469, and then discovered uh, 2002. Uh, just for reference, this, is, uh, this bit of the United Kingdom is Wales, and the Newport ship was found up the Severn Estuary, up the Usk River, uh, just here, and if we believe the, well, the origin, the dendrochronological origin of the hull planking is here, and then all the environmental evidence we find on board and the ceramics and the coins all appear to be from this area south of Lisbon on the Portuguese coast. Uh, this is a reconstruction, a modern uh, depiction of what the ship uh, might have appeared like when it was coming into Newport. And it looks like it was being brought into Newport for repairs. And we know this because 
They've purposely built some sort of cradle structure onto which to bring the ship on a very high tide, and it was set on this cradle, and then they were doing repair work or refitting on the ship, but it looks like this cradle structure collapsed. And the cradle structure was just very crudely shaped logs on both sides propping the ship up. And it looks like, it looks like on the, um, in this inlet or side channel in the river, it looks like this cradle structure collapsed on one side, and without that support, the ship heeled over, and there's an extraordinary uh, tidal range in Newport on the River Usk, and it uh, uh, can be upwards of uh, you know, 14 meters. And it looks like what happened is the ship was nicely propped up during this repair process, and in the middle of repairing the ship, the struts collapsed, the ship fell over onto its side, and then the next incoming tide would have flooded it with hundreds of tons of water. And then we have evidence that they're attempting to drain the vessel and pump it out. We have multiple places where there are pumps in the vessel, and also they're drilling neat little holes in the hull planking between the frames in the lowest parts of the vessel, trying to drain it. And it looks like they're deliberately trying to save the vessel, but they cannot, within the next 12 hours, a huge flooding tide is coming in again and filling it up, which I think is why it's so well preserved. It was almost instantly inundated with mud and water, and the river is very silty and it just filled the ship, almost like a bowl. It just filled it with mud and water repeatedly and the sediment settled out and it sealed the ship, uh, you know, probably within you know, weeks and months. But they then, some, much of the ship was still standing above the mud and water and they salvaged all of that. Anything they could still reach, they removed. Uh, anything they could still reach easily was removed and so we're probably missing about two thirds of the vessel. And what's uh, interesting is they did a fairly crude and quick job of it because there were over a thousand pieces found loose inside of the ship, disarticulated timbers, things like cross beams, knees, hatch covers, they're found down inside the ship, and I have a good photo of that. Uh, so this is a, another modern artist's idea of the ship coming up the river and deliberately put in this side channel and propped up on these, with these logs, and then this repair work happened. And in, in more modern times, in the 19th century, the river was completely, on both sides of the river, was filled with these wharfs and warehouses. And it, uh, the Newport ship was found directly underneath this moderator wharf here. And uh, again, there was no modern, the um, watching brief, the research the archeologists did before digging said there was no likelihood of any big find in this area. And so it really was a shock find and it then turned into a rescue excavation. It uh, was discovered in the summer of 2002, and it was initially not going to be saved. It was just going to be, they gave the archeologists a few days to uh, uncover what they could, record what they could, and then they were going to remove it mechanically and dispose of it because it was holding up building works for this um, theater and arts center, this cultural center. And it, uh, the archeologists pleaded for more time, but it really, the, the city said, no, it's not important. We must move on and continue with this building, this cultural center. And the public really got upset about this because Newport had a bit of a track record for destroying heritage uh, in recent times. And the city actually rose up and started to protest around the clock, 24 hours vigils to try to force the government and the national, the Welsh government, to step in and try to save the ship. And so this formation of this group called the Friends of the Newport Ship, this charity, they, they did parades through town and petitions in order to save the ship. And they, they uh, received a huge amount of support from the public and we had three open days. The site was a construction site. It was open to the public for three days, just a few hours each day over in August and September of 2002. And they had over 22,000 people queue up for up to four hours. You can see the queue going back just to see what all the fuss was about, to see what this um, <laughs> thing was in the ground. And so the public interest was immense from, from the start. And it was because of this public protest that the Welsh government and the city council work together to find money to, in order to hold off on the development at least for a few months while they did a proper excavation. It was still a res rescue excavation. It took um, three months to uncover the ship, uncover the remains, and then it took about three months to actually disassemble the ship and, and lift it. So this is the site as seen from the air. This is the sheet pile coffer dam they put in. And the miracle of it is that the Newport ship, this is the stern of the vessel, and that's the bow of the vessel. Without knowing the ship was there, they, at random, they put the, the coffer dam in more or less perfectly. There was a little bit of the bow that got clipped off, 
and a small portion of the uh, starboard stern quarter that also got clipped off. However, they were allowed to go back and dig up the, the timbers on the other side of the wall here, and that was about 125 additional timbers that comprised the stem post and some of the uh, planking. However, the archaeologists were not allowed to dig back here because of the fear that it would undermine the seawall, the river defenses, and, and floods. So we do not have all of the ship, but we have the vast majority of it, and that's the, uh, the building they did on top. Right, so during the excavation, this is ground level up here, so seven meters of alluvial sediment had to be re was removed, and actually then they discovered the ship. There was all sorts of archaeology. I don't have time to go into it all, but um, the ship was, was a surprise find in the bottom, and they just found a little bit of the port side up here, just a few planks and a couple of frames, and they thought oh, it could just be a revetment or some loose timbers, but they just kept digging, and it just kept growing. And what you see there, there is actually no single photo of the ship in the ground that shows the whole thing. It was impossible because it was so big. Uh, and what we have is over 22 meters of remains and uh, over eight meters in width. And what you see here is actually represents several thousand uh, hull timbers. And these photos actually show the vessel cleaned out. I mentioned there's over a thousand more timbers inside the ship that were loose, parts of the upper works and the decks and the beams and all that. All that's been removed for these photos. But what you see here are, is the articulated hull. Uh, the bow is up here. This is the stern. This is the port side, starboard side. There's an archaeologist there for scale. This is the center line. There's the mast up keelson with the bracing. Uh, you have stringers, and then you have these framing timbers. And what you can't see is the outer hull, uh, lap strike planking throughout. The entire vessel is clinker built. The entire structural, everything structural on the vessel is uh, oak, with the exception of the keel, which is beech. And uh, we we'll talk more about that in a bit. It, not only was the ship cut by this copper dam, it was also uh, damaged by the insertion of all these concrete piles, half meter by half meter piles. They drove through the site before they knew the ship was there. And so in this situation, uh, they drove uh, 92 of these piles through the site. 17 of them went into the ship. And uh, both because of the presence of these piles, which could not be removed, and also the Coffer dam, it was not possible to dig around the ship or, and lift it as one piece. The only option was to actually disassemble the ship into all of its individual pieces and raise them. And so that is what happened starting in the autumn of 2002. They worked very quickly under huge pressure to actually disassemble the ship. And the problem was it was so well preserved. Um, I won't talk too much about clinker shipbuilding, but the lap straight planking was fastened together with wrought iron clench nails. Uh, thousands, tens of thousands of these nails. Uh, what was really interesting is almost all of them had dissolved and corroded into nothing, but all the wooden tree nails that were holding the planking to the framing were as preserved as the rest of the oak, and it proved uh, very difficult to disassemble the ship. It actually had to be pried apart. They had to pound wooden wedges like door stops into the framing timbers just to get a few millimeters of space in order to get a saw blade in and try to cut each tree nail. And that's what was so time consuming. There was thousands of these intersections where these planks and frames crossed where there was one or even sometimes two tree nails driven in. And so it was extremely time consuming to, uh, to take the ship apart. And that's the um, uncovered, that's the inside of the uh, hull, of, hull of the vessel. There are approximately 35 extant strakes on the starboard side and 16, 17 on the port side. And uh, almost, and there's over 63 surviving frame stations. And there are actually, when you count the framing timbers and you know, the floor timbers and the futtocks, there are over 300 elements of, of just the framing and there are over 700 planks on the vessel. Uh, parts, fragments of planks, and I think around 300 complete full planks. So a, a huge amount of timber. That's what it was like to work on site. Uh, very you know, cold, wet and muddy in the summer and then bitterly cold, wet and muddy in the winter. There was snowing on them in the last few days. But they worked uh, long days around you know, every week, you know, full weeks every week to, to excavate the ship. And the last few pieces that were removed from the vessel, once they removed the hull planking, they had access to the keel. And the keel was beach and it had the oak planks, the garboard planks on the side of the keel almost covered the keel. They covered about three quarters of the keel. And the beach was in such bad condition, poor, poorly preserved, that they kept the oak uh, strakes on, the planks on, and just cut the keel into sections and lifted that uh, just to keep it from breaking. And what was interesting was they thought that was the end of it, but then underneath the keel and in the mud on both sides, that's when they found these struts, these big logs. And then they 
started to date these through dendrochronology and found out that this cradle structure was the late 1460s and it was extremely, um, it was a very practical solution to support the ship. Ship was directly on it. And so they raised a few of these cradle timbers and then they found the human skeleton and it turns out everyone thought the poor, it's a 25 to 30 year old male, everyone thought the poor guy got crushed when the ship fell over. But it, it was only radiocarbon dating about uh, four months later. That skeleton is from the Iron Age. It's from 180 BC. Nothing to do with the ship. It just happened to be a body that was buried in the side channel there in the river, and the ship fell on top of it 1,500 years later. But uh, at the time, it looked like it was related. And that's the archaeologists uh, digging up the, uh, the, bow, the, sh the bow timbers and the stem posts there. So fast forward a bit. 2002 was the excavation, and in 2003, they, in April of 2003, they dug a bit of the bow up that they, they were able to get permission to on the outside of the cofferdam. Then they, they paused and took, got their breath and said, okay, what next? And in the intervening, during that time, they had uh, all the ship disassembled in tanks, and we had over 17 of these tanks, and the tanks are five by 10 meters, and each, and we had, we had 3,100 pieces of timber and 1,000 artifacts from this one vessel. And we had a huge warehouse and the timbers were just laid out. That was our work facility. And we started to, we did a pilot study in 2004 to figure out how to record, how to clean and record everything. And then, uh, and do the general chronological research. And then we, we got government funding to expand to a team of 15 people and we started to systematically clean and record the entire assemblage, all the timbers and artifacts, and then photo doing photography as well and dendrochronology, and then preparing the timbers for conservation. And we were actually able to do the conservation work in these same tanks. We would clean the timbers, and then we'd use the, I'll talk a bit about the end about the, the conservation treatment, <coughs> but uh, it was a great facility to work in. First thing we had to do was clean the timbers. They were covered in concretion. I, I already said the timbers were as hard as a rock. It was phenomenal. These timbers, they were just nothing but original edges, original surfaces. But you couldn't see much of that because of the concretion. The tar and the corroded iron fasteners and the alluvial river clay all stuck to the surfaces. And a huge amount of animal fiber as well was mixed with the tar. So the first thing we had to do was clean all the timbers. And what we uncovered after you cleaned the timbers was phenomenal preservation. You have the original edges, surfaces, all the tool marks. These are outboard face of a floor timber that you can see the joggles and the rebates for the iron nail heads. Uh, that's a section through the keel. But just keep in mind, we had 17 tanks full of material and a lot of it, some of it was over a ton in weight and uh, a lot of it had to be handled by gantries and forklifts, uh, couldn't be lifted by people. So that was what the cleaning involved. That's what timber, that was a plank. You know, that's when we received it, that's what a plank looked like. And we, we took samples of, you can see the, um, the iron nail heads where they used to be, that's just corrosion product, and then just alluvial clay. But you see up here, that's the land the, where the planks overlap, and that's animal fiber and tar mixed together. We must have uh, scraped off and thrown away entire skips, dumpsters full of this material and uh, animal fiber. But we took about 3,000 samples as well. And what was so important about this cleaning process was what we found on the surface of the timbers. Not only did we have the geometry, these edges and, and fastener positions preserved, but we had the inscribed lines preserved. Now, you can see this. This is just the face of a plank. You can see these score marks, uh, possibly count marks. But we have much more interesting ones, too, where you have converging lines and you have converging arcs, and you have it on multiple planks, one after another after another. And it's really helped us determine construction sequence by examining these marks and figuring out when they were applied. There are over 1,200 examples of these marks. And not only are they on the protected inboard, we find half of them on the outboard face of the hull. The outboard surface, the planks that were facing the ocean, are that well preserved that you have these marks. One millimeter, two millimeters deep preserved on the uh, surface of the timber. We have documented all of these. And I think one of the most remarkable, oh, you can also see the impressions where the nail, that was a nail, that was the rove, the square plate on the inside of the plank. You can see the nail head impression. Can you see that, that star? That's the maker's mark on the underside of the nail head. That nail is long gone, but when they made that nail, it has this little maker's mark uh, standing proud on the underside of the nail head. 
They drove that into the timber, that shape pressed into the timber, that nail's dissolved long ago, but that, sh that mark remains. We found dozens of these. We didn't believe it at first, but we kept seeing it and we finally realized it actually exists. That's the level of preservation. And this is why this post-secondary, this second phase of documentation, you do something in the field, you record the size and shape and number everything, but it's absolutely critical that you do the second phase of detailed recording because you can't see things like this in the field. You have to do this uh, cleaning of the ship timbers in order to uncover it. Uh, fabulous preservation of tool marks. On, you know, the edges and the tool marks uh, <coughs> everywhere. You can see where the tree nails have been cut and where these, uh, you just, there are tool marks on, on all the timbers. And they're very interesting. It's radially split oak, as you'd expect. The entire hull is lap straight built. Uh, it's interesting, though, because on some of the internal hull timbers, some of the internal structure, we have saw marks. So they had saws available to them, but it's things like the stringers were sawn, and especially the ceiling planks were sawn, but really everything structural, really structural, the um, uh, planking and the uh, framing, it's just nothing but axe marks. So in uh, 2004, we started to digitally record the timbers. We used something called a contact digitizer, a ferro arm, and you simply use a CAD software program and you use this ferro arm. It's like a three-dimensional arm that you, you take the probe tip and you draw, draw, physically draw along the edges of the timbers. You outline the fasteners and the wood grain and you just put this information on different layers in CAD software. And it's a three-dimensional um, sub-millimeter accurate representation of the timber. We did this with every single timber and we did our, we, you can make printouts from this, but you could also take this three-dimensional digital data uh, and, and do a lot with it, and I'll show you what we've done with it. We had four of these ferro arms, and we trained up about half the archaeological and conservation team to use them, and we ran it like a factory where we worked every day. We'd, we had thousands of timbers to do, and sometimes you could only do one or two timbers in a day. So we, we had four setups, and we just processed the material as quickly as possible, but it still took three or four years to actually do this basic documentation. After that, this was really the clever part. This is the early days of 3D printing. It was very experimental back, this is over 10 years ago. We would take our 3D drawing and make a 3D model out of it. We'd email it to Cardiff University in Wales and they would 3D print it for us using laser sintering and post back a box of one to 10 scale ship parts that had every single fastener and facet and scarf and land on each of these little timber model pieces. And we put it together one piece at a time and built a one to 10 scale model of the Newport ship, at least the, you know, the extant hull, the, the, what was articulated. And we also printed all of the loose timbers as well. And over the years, we built this model and then we started adding to it, you know, ghosting in the missing areas, adding the repair parts, the repair patches, and then putting the, these loose timbers that we found, these hatch covers and deck beams and knees back in their position, like basically by floating them up to where we think they would have gone in the original vessel. And then even recently we've been, uh, we've been adding to the model, figuring out what the stern looked like. And uh, you can see, I don't know how easy it is to see some of these people here, but that's a 1.8 meter tall person to give you an idea of the scale. So the ship is, arguably about 30 meters long on the keel and up to 35 meters long originally on the uh, you know, stem to stern. So it's a, it's a very large vessel and it's very hard to get that up across. I mean, there's a lot surviving. I mean, it would probably be half again as long as this room here, but uh, we are only have about a third of it. So because we had high resolution, three-dimensional digital data, we were able to reconstruct the vessel both physically in that model form and also digitally. And so we've, we've used uh, naval architecture software to, to help us fare the curves and ghost in the missing areas. You can see what we have in brown there and what, how, what we believe the rest of the vessel look like. And uh, we've been able to do things like model its sailing characteristics, its sea keeping, how, how, how it would behave in um, various weather and, and sea states, and how its sailing characteristics, you know, when the wind's blowing at such and such a speed, you know, how it would behave. And we've also been able to model, you know, put cargo in the vessel, see how the, the volume it could carry, and also how that would affect stability. And uh, just a cutaway view of the uh, vessel uh, loaded with casks. And uh, actually the colors are important. The brown is what we actually have archeologically recovered. The green is what we have 
direct archaeological evidence of, and then the red is complete conjecture. It's based on other parallel archaeology or iconography, and it has to be there for the ship to work, but it's the areas we're, not, we're least confident in. But we are very confident, obviously, in the archaeological material and also what we have indirect archaeological material. We have things like we know the size of the mast at the base, we know the size of the mast at the first deck because we found the mast partner, the collar, and you know, we have indirect evidence of all these other dimensions, but the red is the area we are least uh, certain about. And that's the same cargo out on a pier to give you an idea of the uh, size and shape, size, uh, volume of the hold. So uh, you'd probably be very interested to know uh, the probable origin of the ship, or at least the hull planking. For years, we had been cutting planks and frames and looking at the tree rings and building up a dendrochronological database. Uh, and this, we had a brilliant chronology. It matched only itself, though. We could tell you that this plank and this one and the one over there, the one up there, one back here, not only were they the same, um, same date, the same forest, they were the same tree. But we could not match that against any known chronology anywhere, and nothing in northern Europe anyway. And, and we just kept trying, kept trying. And the breakthrough only came um, about seven or eight years after the excavation. This data had all been collected, and for three or four years had just been you know, sitting there trying to match. And they started to do a comprehensive program in the uh, you know, Iberian Peninsula to take samples in places like sorry, the old, um, you know, the old farmhouses and just try to uh, build up the reference chronology uh, in, these re in this region. And it was after this research had happened that we started to get very high T-value matches, very significant correlations. And what was very interesting is that they're, um, they're not on the coast, they're inland. And, but the T-values are kind of without question that the timbers are from um, this area. And I can, uh, Araba, or the, the closest match is Ar Ar Arab. Yeah. I don't know. All right. I don't know. Uh, but if you want more information, you really want to look into this, we have published a big report on this, and I won't go into the details here. But uh, what's really interesting, the planking, certainly from here. The framing, again, doesn't, we've tested it, it matches against itself, big chronology, but doesn't match against anything. It, it certainly, it's not similar to the planking at all. And so it's really interesting. The, uh, we need to do a lot more work on the dendro chronology, but we are, you know, getting some some good matches anyway. And that's, uh, it's, a, it's a data set that's publicly available. So the, you know, these, uh, this tree ring <coughs> chronology is, is, like most of our data is publicly available and I'll, I'll let you know how you can get access to it if you're interested. Uh, we've already talked about trees a bit today so I'll just uh, gloss over this. But uh, what's really interesting on Newport ship, on the timbers, extremely high quality, very straight grained, uh, almost no knots. Uh, there is a bit of sapwood here and there but What's amazing is the planks, the planks, this is a big ship, the planks on the ship, 25 to 30 millimeters thick everywhere. The, the planks are around 250 mil in width and feather edge scarfs. I mean, if you gave me a single plank from this boat, from this ship, you would think it was from a 10 meter long vessel. But these all came off this ship and they're all, they're, they're very, they're variable in length. They vary between we have planks, full planks with two scarfs and lands top and bottom that are less than, well, about a meter long. And then we have other planks that are over five meters long, but they're exactly the same, about 250 wide, about 25 to 30 mil thick. And it's interesting, they do taper in width towards the ends of the vessel very regularly. And I think that's part of the way they're controlling the shape. However, uh, everything, uh, the, the hundreds of planks that we've analyzed, the, um, the width and the thickness are very, very regular at, in, you know, in, um, for the majority of the vessel. Very high quality materials. And interestingly, we find evidence of forest practice as well on board forest management. You have on timbers, you find oak and some of the non-oak timbers, you find places where the side branch has been trimmed and the tree continues to grow for another, uh, in this case, 40, 60, 80 years. And it just shows active management of the forests. And we have archaeological proof of this in these uh, various timbers throughout the hull. And uh, you know, we have the, the V-shaped timbers and the Y-shaped timbers. They're present, perfectly preserved. And we've been working to reconstruct some of the uh, trees they came out of. 
And same thing with the beach keel of the ship, a single piece, and it was probably originally, it's a damaged on the stern, but it was over 20 meters in length. And obviously they probably would have preferred oak, but you couldn't find a piece of oak that was growing, you know, arrow straight and uh, uh, at the time. But so, but beach was uh, suitable. What was really, um, well, skip that. And what's, what's really um, frustrating is we we're just probably missing the last meter and a half of the keel, right? And it is something's happening on the keel at the very stern. We have the stem and the stem post, part, the lower part of the stem post and the forward part of the keel, and we have that joint, and it's really important, I'll show you why in a minute. But we're, you can see at the stern of the vessel that the keel is starting to get noticeably taller and a little bit bigger, and it's just, you look at it and you look at what the planking's doing, and we're probably only missing a meter and a half of the stern of the vessel, but uh, unfortunately it was never, it wasn't possible to recover that. It might still be there under that building, but there's no chance of getting at it. Uh, again, I, I won't spend too much time on um, lap strike shipbuilding, just to say that the planks for the vessel are radially split, and that involves splitting the tree and to wedge shape and then trimming those wedges. It's not really a matter of strength, it's a matter of skill. And uh, it's you know, fa fabulous way of building a ship. It's just time consuming and there's a lot of wastage. It's materials intensive. But uh, you know, Newport ship, uh, everything we, er, the entire outer hull of the vessel is, is lap strake, is, is clinker built. So some, uh, a little bit about the artifacts. Uh, we, Initially, when they found the ship, they, they didn't even know it was medieval because the construction style suggested medieval, but the condition was, it was remarkable. People were walking on it. It, it couldn't be medieval. It, it was so well preserved. But it was only when they started getting some dendrochronology dates of some loose timbers in the 1460s, when, that was one of the initial dates, 1465, they realized this thing's actually medieval and therefore even more significant. And uh, so that was a working assumption, you know, 1460s, and then the next really important bit of dating evidence, we only got like three or four years after this, we were cleaning the keel in the ship center and we were all having lunch upstairs and the conservator came running upstairs and said, I think I found a coin. And we didn't believe her, we didn't even get up. And she had to drag us downstairs to show us this. And it, inside, this is the keel, the forwardmost part of the keel, and that's where the stem post scarfs onto it and goes up. There was a little tiny rebate chiseled in there and there was a silver French coin put in that rebate with a cross on it. That coin was only minted for two months in 1447 and uh, it's French, but that's not terribly significant in itself. It's what's significant is the fact that it has a cross on it and it's put there for good luck. So that was a great bit of dating evidence. And uh, well, the little bit the other coins were found were all Portuguese and uh, well, well, and so the first bit of dating evidence was initially what was happened in the ground, you know, this 1460s. Then the coin suggested could be earlier. And then the planking, we got the, hull, the match of the hull planking in the Basque country was sometime after 1449. And so, and then we know the ships in Newport in the late 1460s. And so we started to get a really good handle on the use life of the vessel. And it's, uh, it was maximum use life. It's still a bit vague on exactly when it was built because it's, uh, there, there's some sapwood estimates involved. It's, I don't want to get into technicalities, but it's, it's sometime after 1449. It can't be any earlier than that. So during the excavation, I, I mentioned it was completely filled with mud. Well, and it was just river mud. It was just this clear gray or gray alluvial clay. What was very interesting was when you got down really close to the bilges, to the bottom of the ship, especially in the interframe spaces, the sediment was different. It wasn't this river clay. It was actually this black, gritty sediment, and that was from an accumulation from the use life of the vessel. And uh, there was no time on site during the excavation to actually process this, so they simply scooped all of it up between each frame and put it in a bag and labeled it. And it took us about eight or nine years to get back to these bags. And we opened the bags and processed them and it, it doubled our knowledge about the ship. We did these you know, sieves and flots and residues and we, it was a fantastic survival of insect remains, plant remains, ceramics, uh, things that were just obviously would have been missed during the uh, field work, but they were sampled. And absolutely amazing insect collection. And um, interesting, we have human fleas, we have dog fleas, we have rat fleas on board. We have um, 
beetles that have never been found in the UK before. And there were lice. It just, there's pages and pages of this, but it, I think it was a pretty grim experience on board the vessel, at least deep down in the vessel, both the smell and all the critters that you were sharing it with. Absolutely fantastic range of, of faunal remains and everything you can imagine. Seven, 17 types of fish and shellfish uh, found on board the ship. Nothing terribly exotic, uh, but almost everything seems to be, nothing seems to be decidedly Northern European. It seems to be Iberian Atlantic. And, but it's all stuff you could find locally on these, along the coasts or out uh, on the sailing routes. And a huge variety of faunal remains, uh, chickens, ducks, pigs, goats, I mean, you name it, it was found on board the ship. Rabbit-sized rats on board the ship. And they were huge, the ancient rats. They, they had, the mandibles had no teeth in them, but they, you know, the rats were, based on the mandibles, they were you know, this big. And so uh, again, the ship was alive with uh, creatures, both good and bad. Uh, a lot of different foodstuffs were found preserved in the mud, and it's really difficult to pick apart what could be cargo and what could be foodstuffs for the crew, but the assumption is that most of what we're seeing is, um, well, it could be both, but most of what we're seeing is probably evidence of what the crew ate. And it's things you'd expect to find, uh, nutritious, stable foods like nuts, uh, grapes, probably not grapes, though, probably raisins, uh, apples, coriander. We found uh, pomegranates on board, and you know, there's things like strawberries. Just a, it's an interesting mix, but none of it's very British. None of it's, some of it's decidedly not British. And this goes back to what I said earlier. Everything we find on board is, is, uh, seems to be Portuguese, and we have some very specific examples of this as well. And that's uh, that mud they sampled between the frames of the vessel. 50%, half of every bag of mud was filled with these small green leaves, and it's... Uh, couldn't figure out what it was for years, and then uh, it was finally identified. These little green leaves are something called Western Prickly Juniper, and this particular species or subspecies of this juniper only grows on the southern coast of Portugal, on the Atlantic coast, and down at the Algar Algarve a little bit. And it's a totally worthless plant, nothing eats it, but the ship was absolutely full of it. And we, when we looked at the plant, the structure of it, and its distribution, and also the fact that it was mixed with two other plants, Portuguese crowberry and heather. And what was important about the heather was that it was in flower. And both these berries and the flowering heather just happen in late summer. Uh, what's happening, and this, so it's clear that this is being harvested. This all kind of grows together. This is being harvested in late summer because the heather's in bloom. It's all mixed together. It's being brought, huge amounts of it are being brought into the ship. And they're putting it down as dunnage, as a pad to put the cargo on. And the cargo, we found parts of over 100 casks on board the ship. Not, no more than two or three or four elements, uh, maybe from each cask, but the, of all different sizes, but the vessel was absolutely everywhere there was parts of casks on board the ship. And so it seems that it's very, we are very confident the ship was engaged in the wine trade, and this botanical evidence supports that, in that the <coughs> wine is being prepared and you know, grapes are getting ripe late summer, being harvested, and they're, they're preparing the ships to take the wine back to Bristol, to the UK. There's insatiable demand for wine there, and it looks like we can determine seasonality that the vessel seems to be repeatedly engaged in this, and all the historical records we have in the UK and Bristol, they talk about this wine trade from the uh, Iberian Peninsula and uh, coast of France coming up. I don't have time to talk about the politics and uh, how complicated it is during this period, but uh, we are quite confident that the ship is engaged in the wine trade based on the archaeological evidence. Nothing is known about the ship historically, nothing definitive. Every single thing we know about the ship has been determined archaeologically. Uh, interesting here, the, um, there's probably about 500 pieces of ceramic on board the ship. Every single piece is Portuguese Merida redware or micaceous redware. Every single piece. And what's interesting is none of it's, all of it's broken, shattered. A lot of it has soot staining on it. It doesn't look like it's any sort of cargo. It looks like it's what the crew is using uh, to carry on, to live on board the vessel. None of it's, there's no serial types. It's all individual different elements and uh, it's scattered throughout the vessel. We know actually a bit about distribution of space on board the ship too because in the very forward part of the ship, down in the mud, preponderance of human food items uh, things that humans like to eat, but very little in the very stern area of the vessel. But what we find in the stern are all these odd seeds and grasses that humans 
can't or don't eat, and, but animals do. And it looks like there's a deliberate positioning of both animal feed and possibly animal bedding on board the ship, which fits with the bones we found. Some of the bones, like the chicken bones, and the, you can't preserve a chicken. I mean, you have to keep them alive, and then you, you use them, get the eggs, and use the meat as and when you need it. But we have evidence that there have livestock on board the ship. Uh, rigging. We have parts of over 30 rigging elements on board the ship and a, a fair amount of cordage surviving. And this is fairly unusual for the medieval period. But what's almost most remarkable is what's not here. There isn't a single piece of rigging here that's bigger than this. The ship had big blocks, big pulleys, lots of cordage. All of this is missing. In fact, if you looked at the thousand artifacts, there's probably not a single artifact that you couldn't lift with one hand. Everything that was really valuable and big on the ship was removed. There are no anchors, there are no guns, but we have stone, we have stone shot. You know, we have the, stone, the guns, you know, these wrought iron breech loading guns would have, you know, very small stone shot. We have the stone shot, but the guns are missing. It's all this that would have been readily reused was, was salvaged. It was easy to get, reasonably easy to get at and valuable. What they didn't, they took some time salvaging the oak and the iron, what they could reach, but the rest they just didn't bother with. So our assemblages, while interesting, are, are small in both um, numbers and uh, size. Uh, being uh, organics like leather, we have really fantastic collection of leather, uh, hundreds of items, really well preserved, uh, lots of different shoes and, and part of a boot. Again, being organic, it was, it was uh, incredibly well preserved, even to the point where there was thread in some of the stitching holes. And this is one of those pointy-toed shoes that curls back and uh, very high fashion. We don't know what it's doing on the ship, but just, you know, just a, there's a fantastic ar a range of artifacts um, surviving. We have some textiles and we have wooden combs. One of the wooden combs has the two sides, one for straightening and one for getting the lice out. Uh, the stone shot I talked about, but even the, the smallest stone shot is about the size of a golf ball. It's, uh, it, it's interesting. And uh, uh, wooden carved, wooden gaming pieces. I just, these are just a selection of the artifacts. There are, there are many, many hundreds. Um, uh, we have really nice uh, archer's wrist guard and it's stamped with Latin inscription, and we have part of a sand glass, you know, used for navigation on board the ship. Uh, really interesting, we have part of an iron helmet, and it's got a, a Latin verse stamped in this, like, uh, Latin strip that goes around the helmet, a biblical verse stamped in there, uh, providing the wearer with good luck. It's a very unusual, really without parallel, this, um, this uh, find. But it alludes to, you know, the ship was probably engaged in multiple things, you know, uh, primarily merchant ship, but also could have been carrying soldiers, pilgrims. I mean, it's really endless. But it, did, it looks like it had a 15-year use life, and it's really hard to pick apart individual journeys because all we have is an accumulation of evidence. And so it's hard, to, it's hard to exactly, we always say maybe and might with what the ship might have been engaged in, but I'm very confident it was uh, primarily a merchant ship, primarily engaged in the wine trade, built... Uh, in the Basque country, somewhere very close to here, and but um, everything on board is Portuguese, nothing's British, so or, or seemingly Basque. It seems to be uh, uh, very strong links to Portugal. That was a ship's knife. Uh, we started the conservation uh, years ago. We soaked the timbers in polyethylene glycol in wax, and then we would put them in a big freeze dryer, and freeze dry them would take months, but the timber that came out was a brilliant condition. It, it just, it was so well preserved, it would take, it took months in each load in the freeze dryer. The problem is the freeze dryer only holds a few hundred timbers. We have thousands of timbers, and so it's just taking years and years to dry the ship out. And so you take them out of the wax, package them, put them in, you know, freeze dryer, and then once they're dry, we built these in our big warehouse. We have a smaller warehouse now, but we built these big storage rooms, and we put the dried timbers in these rooms, and the idea is that should be by the end of um, next year, we should have the entire medieval ship assemblage dry. And we've been working on blueprints and plans for reassembly. And so the ultimate goal of the entire project is to reassemble the medieval ship in a museum. But we're still not quite there with, in terms of drying the timbers. But in the meantime, they're in nice, safe storage in these big rooms. And because we're starting, we probably have about 70%, 70 percent of the ship is dry now. We have thousands of timbers dry. We've started to find timbers that go back together and we've started to reassemble them dry. We've measured them as well with the digital documentation system in order to determine how well things are gonna fit back together. 
because the ship was disassembled in 2002 and it's never been together since. It's been recorded independently, individually. It's been conserved individually. It was really a bit of a gamble after all this drawing out to see if everything would still line up. But uh, luckily, we're very happy with uh, how things are lining up. Just millimeter to millimeter, the angles of the dead rise angles. As we put the planks together, they're matching what we expected. And we're just, we're very happy that we can get the planking shell of the ship back together. However, fitting the framing back in will be um, a bit of a challenge, but I think we'll overcome that when we, uh, you know, this is, these are conserved timbers, dried out. You can, you know, dry to the touch, very strong, extremely strong. And um, we've, the planking looks good, but the, but the framing, these used to fit absolutely tight, but there's a, it's shrinking a little bit differently because of the orientation, how it's converted from the parent trees. Uh, it's not shrinking the same, but the idea is when we reassemble the ship, we'll leave a bit of a gap there. It'll still look right, but it'll, we'll be able to accommodate these uh, subtle changes. And we're right now, the, what we're working on is designing a cradle to support the ship. Uh, very simply, almost all archeological ships that are on display are suffering problems because they're not supported well enough. They tend to point load and sag around the supports. What we're attempting to do with Newport is build a cradle that fits into the interframe spaces and com almost completely hidden this cradle. It would take all the weight of the planking and the framing would sit inside of it. And you'd end up with a solution that allowed you to um, display the hull and you wouldn't really see any cradle supporting it. And it, uh, we've done feasibility studies and we're looking at, we've done stress studies and it looks like it's gonna work. So we're pursuing this as a way to reassemble the hull. And what a key thing about this reassembly is that it would allow, you'd never be more than about 100 millimeters from a support so that ship timbers wouldn't actually have to do much. And so that's where we're headed with our um, cradle structure and that's an idea of it uh, in a museum. We still haven't secured a home for the ship. We're still working on that. The problem is it's huge. It's, we need a 20 by 40 meter hull to build this thing in and there, we have a problem in the city. We don't have anything that big right now, but we are, we are looking, it, it is our biggest problem I think is finding a home. This is what we want to do. We want to reassemble it. Uh, and so that's, it would be a big tourist draw for Newport, which is what it needs. But in the meantime, we've done a huge amount of archeological research and we have published a number of articles in like the International Journal of Nautical Archeology span about the definitive archeological articles and, and elsewhere, probably about 15 articles now. And I think really importantly, we put a, around 20,000 files in the archeology span data service. It's the UK's digital archive for archeology. span These files are everything I've showed you, every site photograph, every drawing of every timber, every 3D model, all of our specialist reports, it's all on the archeology span data service and it's all free. And you can download any of these. It's all PDFs or, or CAD files, it's all there, it's all free. You just Google Newport ship ADS and uh, it will, it is just a wealth of information. The point of the project is to share everything that we've learned and it's all there online. So uh, the articles and, and this book are a good place to start, but if you really want the data and all these specialist reports, there's at least 50 of the specialist reports. All of our drawings, our big um, reconstruction drawings, it's all there and it's all free. So uh, that's, archeologically, I think the project's doing well, but we really want to get it reassembled to have, you know, it's, you know, it's uh, your ship, and uh, we've got it, but we want to put it on display and, you know, for in perpetuity. I think it'd be a huge draw for Newport as a, you know, a huge tourist draw. And it, frankly, the city needs something like this. So that being said, if you're ever in Newport, it's in South Wales. It's only about 20 minutes from Bristol. Uh, we're we, you can get a hold of me and I'll give you a tour of the facility and we're open to the public a couple days a week anyway. But it is a, um, it's only a couple hours to the west of London, pretty easy to get to. So if you ever want to see the work and see the progress. But there's no reason we shouldn't be done and dusted in five years and have the ship reassembled at that point. Um, I think that's the last. Uh, I have um, one copy left, whoever gets to me first. Uh, so, um, but otherwise it's available online, this one. And uh, what's also interesting over the years, the public are still totally engaged in the project. They drop. The Friends of the Ship have hundreds and hundreds of members as a charity, and they, people knock on the door and drop by artwork, and they make clay models, and uh, it's just really, this ship, maybe, I don't know if all projects are like this, but this one in particular has really captured the public's enthusiasm, and they're just still supporting the project uh, 16 years on. 
And so we're building up a massive collection of, of public artifacts as well associated with the SHIP project. Um, right, and there's contact information if you need it. And I just thought, um, I don't know if you, Zabi, if you were going to talk about it all, but um, I'm from the west coast of the U.S. in Oregon, and they have a, they've been doing a lot of research lately. They believe they found a Manila galleon off the Oregon coast called the Beeswax Wreck, and it's... Um, 1694. It's uh, one of the galleons they build out in the Philippines and then sail across. And they, they can't find any timber, but they're finding all kinds of artifacts. And um, so it's, they're pretty certain that this, so if it's of interest to you, there is potentially one of these Iberian, uh, well, not, it's Spanish, but it's Acap um, Philippine built. But uh, it is interesting. And I got a bit of information here about it if anyone wants to know more about that. It's not really my area, but uh, I thought it was more your area, so you might want to know about it. But yeah, you're very welcome to come visit uh, Newport if you're ever in the area. So I know it's lunchtime, so. Bueno, contamos con cinco minutos para preguntas. Si alguien tiene algo que decir, Buenas. Eh, lo, lo primero, felicitar a todo, toda la gente que intervino en, en la recuperación. Just quickly uh, congratulate all the people in that fantastic team for all that great work for uh, what you've done uh, with that wreck. Can't you hear us? Okay. Testing, testing for sound. That's okay now. Good. Good, good. He was, he was congratulating you for that fantastic work for you and all your team. Right. Uh, so, uh, you were talking about uh, what you discovered uh, in the ship. Uh, were there also stones or weights uh, to make sure that the ship uh, had the necessary weight near the key? The keel, sorry? Ballast. Ballast, yeah. A stone on board the vessel, and we did some modeling. And the only way to make the ship go into that side channel, it was scraping on the bedrock, and it was like 20 to 30 millimeters of space. We modeled the weight of the hull, and we digitally floated it in there. And the only way was how they did it was no ballast, which would be very unstable. But they must have towed it in very carefully, and it's clear that they had they had every intention of taking it back out. They were working. The, sh the timbers being fitted into the ship are late 1460s, and they're British. And they're even nailed in position, and they've drilled the bolt holes, but they haven't put the bolts in. Even the, the parts of the bolts are there, you know, in the, like the washers. It's, they're right in the middle of this, and it falls over, and they can't right it. But it was so valuable, they, they definitely attempted to. We have proof of that. Hello. Uh, in order to compare uh, timbers, oh, yes. Hi. Vale. Vale. Sí, no, eh, la pregunta era la siguiente. Eh, de las, las maderas, Comparing eh, the wood, the timber. I'm sorry if I didn't see it, but looking at the map you, sh you were showing, you were comparing, I think, uh, with wood harvested uh, in the so-called Spanish Basque Country. And I don't know if you took samples of the French side of the Basque Country. They were taken throughout, uh, I guess, what you'd call Spanish Basque Country. Uh, but I think we already had some chronologies for France, and there was no matches. But the matches we have here are beyond the, the T values are are so significant they can't really be anything else. I mean, T values of 10, like it's, even when we get to the same trees, we get, we get matches that are, uh, I'm not a dendrochronologist, this, this information comes from our dendrochronologist, and we have great reports if you want to, to read them, but we're, we're very confident that the, in the data and that our timbers are from this. I know it, it's a little bit counterintuitive, they're from, they're from the upland hinterland, they're, they're not coastal at all. So it's interesting. They're trading these planks. And it's been suggested they process the planks, at least roughly, and then transport the planks down. So it's, a, it's an area that just needs a lot more research. 
But um, I think this is lifetimes of work here. We're still in the early days of just trying to gather data and process data and make it available for other researchers. Um, regarding the, the capsizing of the ship, have you ever considered looking into uh, storms that were recorded in those days? Uh, because with a, a storm, they didn't have uh, a flood barrier. Uh, so, so with a storm, you would raise the, the water level and the ship starts floating a little and wind pressure will uh, yeah, uh, incre increase the heel of the ship. And yep. there you go. And it, it, that would fit because it is pushed. It seems to be pushed. The weather comes from the south and it seems it's pushed over to the north. However, we have no archive, local archive surviving, you know, fires and all that. We just have no local historical records that survive. And we have a letter from the Earl of Warwick saying fix my ship in Newport in 1469. It's, I mean, it's, it's not naming a ship, it's talking about a ship in Newport. It, it, it all fits, but it is circumstantial. So I think the answer's out there. I think there is definitely a mention of this in some archive somewhere, because it is a big loss for somebody. But um, we have economic historians, maritime historians working on it uh, as well as, a lot of it, the latest research is in that um, this one about all the uh, historical context, the economic and political context as well, which I haven't gone into. But we're trying to just sort out the archaeology right now. And so, uh, like I said, lifetimes of work here for other people. Thank you. Eh, una segunda pregunta. Me ha parecido ver que en, el, en la reproducción que se hacía de lo que se había reconstruido y de lo que se estimaba que podía ser el barco, que estaba el pozo de achique como indicado en el color de que se había recuperado, el, el pozo de la bomba de achique. ¿Se recuperó eso y se recuperó la, la bomba y el conducto vertical de achique? We, uh, we have parts, over 40 parts of pumps on board the ship. Uh, I mean, at least four different places, and it's it's all just pieces and fragments. But uh, there's a couple things that you have this uh, like elm, elm tree trunk that's been drilled out. Uh, that's found. You have the foot, and you have the uh, the the valve, the foot valve in the bottom. You have at least one of beautiful pump spear. It's leather spear, looks like an umbrella upside down, and it's wood, wooden wood, leather, a second leather cone inside. Phenomenal preservation, and and we have all all over the ship. There you find foot valves, you find um, uh, well other pump parts, and what's amazing is like to a millimeter, they're all the same diameter. They're exact. They're all handmade, but it looks like they have total consistency, and they're making these are spares, spares and end parts. Everything's consistent. We wouldn't necessarily associate that, you know, during this medieval period that they would do like work like that, but. It's all handmade, hand turned, but it's all the same. And so, and it is scattered about. There is the typical Iberian pump hole, right? Just cut through half the keelson to put the, that pump in right there near the main mast. Uh, there's a remains of a pump hole on the other side, and there's one in the bow and one in the stern. And they both seem to be situated, if the vessel had three masts, right where those other two masts would have been. So, it's, uh, and it's interesting too, they've cut away some pretty important structural parts of the vessel, some of the framing, in order to fit these pump tubes in. So it's, uh, we've written a, a fair bit about this, and it's in the big IJA article as well, but happy to share any of this information with you guys. Um, just, just get a hold of me. Thank you. Creo haber entendido de que eh, en las maderas había eh, restos de los clavos. ¿Se ha podido identificar eh, el fabricante de los clavos o la procedencia de, de donde se habían hecho? No, that, uh, we don't know anything about that mark. That, it's more like a six-sided star, and that's what it looks like. We, we can't, we just don't know where to go next. But... Um, there were, uh, there were about a hundred, yeah. 
there were about 100 nails out of the tens of thousands of nails in the ship, there were about 100 that had actual iron surviving and some of the bolts, big bolts, were well preserved. And we analyzed these, uh, metallurgical analysis, and unfortunately it was just inconclusive. I mean, it's wrought iron and it's of varying qualities and it actually looks like varying sources as well. Uh, I could go all day about the, the, some of the repairs on board the ship. I should have said that there are repairs on the ship that are from the 1450s early 1460s, and um, uh, dendrochrono dendrochronologically dated. And very interesting, the tar, we did isotopic analysis of the tar. The original tar put in the ship, in all the, all the lap um, uh, lands, and then the scarf joints, that is all, the isotopic signature is consistent with this latitude with the Basque region, but all the tar on the repairs of the ship, these patches they put on, these tingles we call them, there, the tar is isotopically located to um, uh, southern, southern Portugal latitude. So it's, it's quite interesting, this you know, very different tar was used. And also the um, animal fiber, the animal hair used in the lands and the scarves, absolutely every part of the ship that was a joint was filled with tar and animal hair. That animal hair was um, uh, tannery waste. You could, a lot of it was wool, and the other things were cattle hair, horse hair. I mean, one little sample had nine different animals in it, and it's very clearly tannery waste where they're scraping it off the hides, and they're also collecting this waste wool, and they're selling it to shipwrights, or the shipwrights are disposing of it if it's a problem, and they're, they're putting it in, and just, just we're talking hundreds or thousands, hundreds and hundreds of kilos of it anyway, mixed with the tar. And, you know, I said we have thousands of samples of this, and we've analyzed it, but again, very interesting. And the sheep, the wool that was used in the looting is from uh, sheep that only live in the highlands. Uh, you know, the, they're not lowland sheep, they're highland sheep. They're, it's in a big report, I could, I could signpost it to you that if you're interested. But like I said, I've, I've just touched on the surface. We, we've learned so much about this and it's, um, it's impossible to get it across and just... Bueno, hay muchísimas otros detalles, pero no, desgraciadamente no, no he tenido tiempo para comentarlos. Bueno, muchas gracias. Comunicaros un, una noticia que me han pasado aquí. And for your questions, and before we finish now, let me remind you the bus will be leaving uh, the Antiguo Church uh, for our guided tour just outside our venue here. You will see the church, otherwise follow the pack, and the coach will be leaving at 10 to 4. Please uh, don't be late.